Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox and thanks for logging on. This is Watches Tonight. This evening we're chatting live, talking about watches you should never sell. We're sharing your wrist shots, all that and more tonight on Watches Tonight. Guys, do you want an all-in-one watch valuation news hub and video viewer design for watch collectors? Well, guess what? We built it. It's the new Watchbox app. You can check it out on the Apple App Store or Google Play. It gives you a digest of all the top news stories from your favorite watch news journals, magazines, and sources every morning. It also allows you to browse Watchbox inventory, watch my videos, both here and over on Watchbox reviews, and create a virtual catalog of your own collection for your reference that you can take wherever you go. So check out the Watchbox app that's on Google Play and the Apple App Store. All right, check me out on Instagram because I also have another platform. It's the one where I post my 60 second reviews plus snapshots of my life. Every once in a while there will be a car show, a machine that I think is really cool, maybe as big as a ship, maybe a small set of pens. But no matter what, you'll find it on Tim underscore Masso on Instagram. It's also where I post a lot of the cool stuff that's not publicly listed on the Watchbox website. Jumping straight in, friends, Edward Ledden of Sweden, Joe Pinto of Louisville, Geezer, Enrique Casiano, Matt Foster, Simon Holt, Tariq joining in with Brady P, Jim Millet, Ricardo, Thomas Burnett, Tariq saying hi everyone from Long Island. You know I like that. We also have Paul Steinberg, John N, K2 Horology, CLF, asking Tim, how's the watchmaking training going? Well, had a great episode last week with a full movement overhaul that went about as well as could be hoped. And I think next we're going to try an automatic chronograph. Uh, other than that, I'm just working on techniques for oiling capstones and pallets because those things are fiddly, but moving ahead nicely. And a big thanks to Justin S., our watchmaker downstairs, for staying after work each day to help me out with that. Richard Combs from South Florida, Miroslav joining in. We've got JJ Abdul from Germany and Derek D. London. Welcome, Clive. Welcome, Sandy. And Curtis Arndt, our friend from Southern California. Okay, jumping into tonight's topic, first viewer wrist shots. I asked you answered. Let's check out Nick P., who leads off the order, appropriate since he plays baseball. And he hits. Best regards to you, Nick, and your teammates. I know you're watching the episode. Wasim R. shares the stunning Grunefeld 1 Hertz that he just received from Watchbox Dubai. Thank you for trusting our company, our extended company. Michael C. combines the ultimate driving machine with a German Longomatic Perpetual. Richard C. takes in the Masters with appropriate memorabilia and the Diamond Index Platinum Rolex Daytona. And Carl B. shoots his insane 50mm titanium Rolex Deep Sea Challenge from the top of the half-mile tall Burj Khalifa in Dubai. You can see the electric blue artificial lake right underneath at the base of the building, guys. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your wrist on my list. All right, let's see who's joining in. We've got Greg W., we've got Brent, we've got Faisal joining in from Dubai. He's staying up late, maybe even staying up late enough to be getting up early with us, if you know what I mean. And then we've got JJ and Mark S. from Brooklyn, and we Ben W. made it live for once. Thank you so much for joining in. We Ben, appreciate that. So watches I considered for tonight's feature, and I didn't include them because I've covered them exhaustively in the past. The Vacheron 2000V Overseas Ultra Thin, not going to cover it because we talked about it. Less than 100 made, hugely collectible. It's the closest thing to a overseas jumbo that we've ever seen. So the Vacheron Overseas 2000V, definitely recommended, not in tonight's show. The Rolex Skydweller White Gold, the one year that the White Gold was available on full bracelet with the 2017 dial. You know those are super collectible. I've already talked about them. Also, you guys have heard enough from me about the post-2017 version of the White Gold Platinum and bezel Rolex Yachtmaster 2. Very rare. If you're interested, you can find many past references on watches tonight. And then finally, the last mid-size men's Nautilus, the 5800. Very collectible watch, short production run, but enough has been said. One watch I considered but didn't include because there's not enough time, is something we'll talk about in the future, which is the less than 100 piece 2013 Blanc Pan 50 Fathoms Bathyscaf Ceramic. They had trouble with the ceramized metal, so they made less than 100 of them and they actually recalled some that were already in dealer cases. So if you have one of those in your possession, make sure Blanc Pan is not going to change the case when you send it back. Those are all very collectible watches. 
We've got Soma R joining in from Budapest, staying up late in continental Europe. We've got Fox House Guitar saying, used to hate Tim's sunglasses on his head. Turns out that's the thing I miss most. We can always bring them back, but I need plastic sunglasses to do that because I found with the metal gaiters, they fall off. And also, I used to have a lot less hair. People told me, grow in your hair to soften your image. And I always had the glasses up there before, but now that I have all this hair, the sunglasses mat down the hair. So it's got to be like one or the other, I think. What else is going on in the box? We've got Ivan Jan saying, happy to be joining for the first time. Welcome, thank you for joining me and I appreciate you making the time. Geezer, FP Journe Chronomet Bleu, good long-term hold. Yes, long-term hold, very much so. But let's talk about watches that we haven't discussed on the show before, starting with Rolex, because I know this is always where people start their collecting journey, collectible Rolex. So let's talk about one that was built for a relatively short period of time. This is the Rolex Deep CC Dweller D Blue, the 126. 6660. This is the one that was made between 2018 and 2022. I don't think anyone expected last year that Rolex was going to redesign the Deep Sea with a million little detail changes that would otherwise be impossible to notice. But it meant that this reference wound up being both a little bit more practical with some features not found on the new watch and relatively rare as it was only run for a short period and they're not making any more. So it's the best of the second generation Deep Sea. And I'm including the deep blue because that one's always scarcer than the standard deep sea. But the second generation gave you the new 70 hour movement, the Chronergy escapement, broader bracelet end links with thinner lugs, shorter lug to lug and end link to end link measurement, better ergonomics across the board. It gave you all of that with far superior small wrist fit than the 2008 to 2017 model. And it has a double extension system inside the clasp. That's it right there. The 2022 model still has the flip up on the wrist glide lock system, but it doesn't have that flip lock system that you see off to the right of the image. It only has the one. The intermediate generation, 18 to 21, 18 to 22, it has both features in the clasp, which is why I think it's the one to own. Now this is currently not recognized as a must have. This watch is well known but it's been so recently in our rear view mirror that I don't think we can see it in perspective. But I think the deep blue second generation deep sea is going to wind up being the most collectible of them all. Unless of course you have the deep sea owned verifiably by a certain James Cameron. But this is a watch to keep an eye on. It's fun to wear, it's fun to own, even with my little baby wrist, I can wear it. It's a fun weekend watch, it's a fun swimming watch, in its element, it has no equal. The current value is about $16,000 with box and papers, and that's very reasonable given its rarity, its desirability, and potential collectability. Remember, the current 136 660 is still in production, and it costs 1,000, well, it cost $14,460, which is only about, you know, like $1,540 less than actually going out and buying the collectible discontinued watch. I would buy the collectible discontinued watch. That's my point right there. Let's see, we've got Aaron W. in the box asking, what am I wearing? This is literally serial number 001 of the Garrick S6. I'll be talking more about the Garrick in the future, but I love everything about it. Double guilloche dial, sub-register and primary, custom hands, custom guilloche, custom dial color, custom movement with engraving, uh, very neat English watch made very traditionally in Norfolk, England. We'll be talking about them more in the future. We've got Troublemaker asking, do you think the OP39114300 rhodium blue or grape could be collectible? Short production time, not appreciated originally very much. Yeah, uh, I would say that series made from 2015 to uh, 2019, especially some of the less common dials like the grape are going to be hugely sought after, uh, especially considering they're more wearable for some people than the OP41. There's some folks that cannot wear the OP41. They can still wear the 39. I think ultimately that is going to be one to own and love. We got a question from PKI, Tim Patek 3710 long-term hold, huge long-term hold on the Nautilus 37. That came out in 1998. That was the first ever complicated Nautilus. If you owned one of those in the past, 
hang on to it. That's going nowhere but up. Even if the market softened, that would only mean it goes up more slowly. So uh, definitely recommended if you own one of those, if you own the one year only 3712 moon phase, hang on to those Nautiluses or Nautili. Eric R. saying, love my Long Untina Albert, adding a Christian L 30 CP. Have you seen one? Nope, I haven't. Um, I have not, but hopefully in the future, I learn something new every day. And often it's when someone else pulls up a watch I haven't seen or I encounter a watch that I've never encountered. And we got Mark S. Tim, Rolex flip adjustment or brogially push button. Uh, push button for me because I'm generally not using a flip out all the way over a big extension like a sweater or a coat or a dive suit. But a little bit of adjustability and in increments, that's a lot more valuable to me for fitting. And we got Deech 2086 from Western Massachusetts. Okay, so more action on the Rolex from Rolex OP41 Red Coral. Actually, after 2021, Rolex discontinued three colorful OP41 dials, the Tiffany Turquoise, the Yellow, and the Red Coral. Now, here's the thing. Everyone knows that the so-called OP41 Tiffany was a two-year deal, and it's very desirable. Technically, this was the turquoise dial, but the equally rare red coral OP41 is not quite as recognized, and in my op opinion, in my honest opinion, it's a more striking watch in person. It's somewhere between red and orange, lustrous and lacquered. It has serious wrist presence that pairs well with colorful straps. You can throw a whole bunch of colors on here, light, dark, the whole spectrum. It's going to look a little bit more natural than the turquoise dial, so there's some flexibility here. Now, dials and bezels define the most collectible Rolex watches, and here is one great dial. Current value is going to be around 22 to 23,000. That's the meat of the market and you compare that to the Tiffany which is 11 to 15 grand more I know which one I'm buying I'm not saying the Tiffany is going to lose value but I'm going to say it probably doesn't have as much upside as either the coral red or the yellow so if you're looking at something to buy or to hold definitely consider those because they're a little bit below the radar in this Tiffany obsessed era remember if you want a real Rolex Tiffany dial you're buying vintage the Tiffany turquoise dial might lose a little bit of steam and tread water for a few years once people realize that A, there's fairly a lot of them, and B, the Tiffany is a nickname only. Whereas this, I can see this being a gainer. Now, here's one I've talked about before, but not in a while, so it's going to be new to some of you. And this is the roughly 2011 Rolex Datejust Turnograph, the 116 263. This was a Japanese domestic market limited series. A yellow, gold, and steel it was available either Jubilee or Oyster Bracelet. They made one dial that was white, one dial that was black. What set it apart? the green seconds hand and the date disc to match. So the seconds hand is green lacquered. The date disc features numerals in green. Whether you go with the white dial or the black dial, you're going to get those distinctions. Now this model is not well known outside of East Asian collector circles and really not well known outside of Japan. It's a very scarce, very wearable last of the line for the rotating bezel instrument style date just. And the Turnograph legacy goes all the way back to 1952, so there's real history here. And there is not currently a Turnograph in the collection. And of the last generation of Turnos, this is definitely the one that you want to own. Again, super scarce. I like the black dial, you might like the white, but with only 600 made over the two editions, it's always going to be hard to find. Current value, well, it can be difficult to know for sure until one of them comes up, but archival pricing and auction results and comparison to other 116263s suggests that ten to thirteen thousand dollars would be the price range. And as these become better known in the West and the Middle East, they're becoming more collectible, which is why I say if you own one, don't sell it. This is not a watch that stands to lose anything, even if the economic bubbles were to burst or deflate. This is one to own for the future and to enjoy in the present. Okay, let's see what you guys are saying in the box. Chris Davis, hi Tim. Should one trade watches for other watches that one shouldn't sell? Yes, I would say in general, trade a scarce watch for a scarce watch 
and a hard to find watch for a hard to find watch. As long as you're getting equal value or like for like, I think that's all right. I don't think there's anything wrong with trading a Yenko Camaro for a Shelby Mustang. As long as they're both authentic and verified, I think that's a fair trade. Both parties are coming off well, and you still have that long-term keeper asset. So absolutely, I would say that, and I would say that without any second thoughts. Mark S. at Frank V. His new metal sunglasses would fall off his head, so he stopped wearing them. That's why I'm not wearing the sunglasses. And then we have a question from Ricardo. What Breguet would you go for, Tim? Well, assuming an actual Breguet pocket watch by Breguet is not on the table, uh, I really like the 7027 Classic Chronometry, and I really like the... Uh, um, no, pardon me. No, no, no. I like the Classic Chronometry, and I like the original 37 millimeter La Tradition. And I think that one is the 7027. My, my apologies to Breguet fans out there. So yeah, it would be the original um, Classic Chronometry from 2013, the 10 Hz watch, or it would be the original 2005 La Tradition, or it would be, I've seen some incredible Breguets. Maybe the crazy 7057. I, I got to admit, the 7057 is a very likable watch, uh, and it's a lot packed into a small case. What else would go on? Thomas Burnett, 7147 for the win. I agree, definitely a 7147, especially some of the enamel dial versions. Uh, what else is going on here? We've got Matthew D. from Denver, Colorado. And then we've got Abdul saying the Tradition 7027 is my choice. Yeah, for me it would be the 7027 or the white gold version of the 10 Hertz Classique. And yeah, I think I'm happy with that. There's a lot of cool Breguets out there. Uh, I would also say maybe a 7337. Those are really nice. Those are, those are fun watches to own. And, and true to history as well. All right, jumping back into our regularly scheduled program, the Rolex Sea Dweller 4000. This one was made from 2014 to 2017. 40 millimeters, stainless steel, Rolex dive watch, no Cyclops eye magnifier, clean dial, a superb clasp with both glide lock and the flip lock that you can see right there. 40 millimeters in compact means this one wears like a sub and not like a Sea Dweller. Cleaner than a sub, stealthy, not overpriced, what's not to love. If you could design the prototypical collectible Rolex, it would literally be this. It has everything going for it. This Sea Dweller is the big crown submariner of its era, in my opinion. We're all gonna, you know, if you get me there, you could see what I mean in terms of scarcity and where it's going to be down the line. I would compare this to a big crown sub. I would also say the current value of twenty-two to $25,000 is very reasonable. I think this is a watch that has certainly gained in recognition over the last few years. It's not a sleeper anymore, but I also think it's only in the first few meters of a 400 meter dash to where it's going to be. So I would say re realistically, uh, this is a watch to buy now. And I would even say buy two. Buy one for the safe, buy one for your wrist, you will not lose here. If you already own this watch, when I say don't sell, I want to make sure that you understand don't sell. You can sell this right now and buy Bitcoin. You can sell this right now and take a chance on real estate. You can sell this right now and take a punch at buying, I don't know, one quarter of a Porsche 993. But in the long run of all those assets, I think this is the one that's the best because I don't think this is going to go up incrementally over time. I think it's going to multiply three, four, five times. This is one you will wish you bought. It's a deeply impressive watch, and it's one that's a lot of fun to own because, again, it wears like a sub, not like a sea dweller. And, uh, again, this is what a Rolex collectible looks like. But so is this, Rolex Cellini Prince. Updates are in order since I featured this one before. There are n these are now where the... Uh, the Date 8 Oyster Quartz was five years ago. People know they should be buying these, but they haven't started yet. So the vultures are now circling. And it's too late to get a Date 8 Oyster Quartz cheap. Uh, but I should say that the Cellini Prince remains a real opportunity because you can still buy these all day long for under $10,000. And remember, they're all precious metal and they're all rare. 
Like the Day Date Oyster Quartz, the Prince was made for a long time, if you count the number of years, but in small numbers annually, so the actual number made is low, and scarcity is what you want. Historical importance, well, four versions, none of them is common anywhere. Each had a distinct case dial and caliber design, and the dials and the caliber styling were designed to match. A rare Rolex dress watch that doesn't seem derivative of other brands. And with the full strap and the dual deployant clasp, it's an uncommon Rolex combo. As close as Rolex has ever come to to a vintage re-edition, most Rolex vintage re-editions are branded Tudor. The Cellini Prince was a rare case where Rolex looked deep into its history and came back with something that was fairly close to the source material. Current prices all over the map, anywhere from $7,000 to $15,000 dollars depending on model, condition, boxes, papers. But get in now on the ground floor because all of these are going to be going places someday. We're going to like shed a tear when we realize that you could have bought this watch at one point for 6500 bucks with a full set. So if you own them now, hold tight. This is one to keep for the future. By the way, I know I confused everyone with that Breguet narrative, but the 7027 is La Tradition from 2005, and the classic chronometry is the 7727. So if you're watching this in real time, that's what I was talking about. If you're watching this recorded, I'm glad I could set the record straight. What else is going on here? Burning Mr. B saying, I've seen this watch in the flesh. It's very impressive. Jean-Claude Beaver saying, hey, Tim, hey, fellas. Jean-Claude, good to see you right there. Eric Nielsen saying, agree, the Sea Dweller 4000 is more wearable than every planet ocean ever. And Phil P saying, what do you think of the 3800 2000 2005 white dial. Good to keep? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it'll, sometimes this comes down to a matter of personal style. Remember, this is a show about watches not to sell. So if you already have them, don't sell them. But if you're looking to get into a watch, then you owe it to yourself to compare to every alternative out there. So there are some differences between holding a watch and getting into something that's got a future, because a lot of watches have a future. That's why I say it's okay to trade two things of equal value and equal potential, uh, but if you're looking to buy, keep all your options open. What else is going on here? We've got SMCL from Humid Glasgow. Love to see that. And then we have Fox House Guitar saying, I think we need to do 10 minutes on sunglasses. Please, there are too many fashion channels on YouTube already talking about sunglasses and shoes. Not gonna happen here. But we can talk about wrist shots because I asked and you answered and Joseph P. We don't get too many presidential residences here, but he prepares for dinner at Mar-a-Lago with his Zenith Chronomaster Sport two-tone on full bracelet. We've got Mohammed E who goes off-roading with his daughter and her Seiko in Nairobi, Kenya by means of Toyota. And you can see he's also got his Zenith DeFi Classic right there. Wakar A stands surfside with his Breitling Super Ocean Kelly Slater Edition. We've got Miguel M. of San Diego, who commands the road and the surf, with Omega and Range Rover looking good. They're even color-coordinated, which is sharp. We have Eric N. of Asheville, North Carolina, who treats us to a rare Orage Super C GMT sighting. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your watch on this box. Jumping into the box, let's see, we have Amit K. asking, Tim, could you do a similar show on bigger independents like Moser, Grunefeld, Moritz Grossman, presumably Jorn, etc.? Yeah, I'd like to do that. It's going to be a niche topic, low viewership for that one, but why not? We've got JW, thoughts on holding Octo Finissimo S gray dial. No, I, I don't think it's on the list. I think there are too many versions of the Octo Finissimo out there for any one of them to be super collectible. And I really think that Bulgari's got to cut back on the volume and the variance before we can even begin to talk about that. What else is going on? SMCL, any Zeniths outside of the El Primero on your list? They're not on my list. I do have an El Primero on here tonight, but I would say realistically, if you want impressive Zenith watches from the past, Go back and get, your Zenith, get yourself a Zenith with a caliber 135. Get yourself one of the Engel Breguets, which were built with, they were pocket watches, complicated pocket watches, chronometer grade, built with Zenith 5011K Abouches. Or go back to the 90s and get yourself one of the Zenith Elite-powered Mango Divers. That's definitely one to look at. 
And if you can go back to 2012, get yourself the Type 20 Montre d'Aronef with the 5011K movement. If you've got the wrist for it, and remember, it's going to be like 57 millimeters, but if you've got the wrist for it, that's a super collectible Zenith that is not an El Primero and definitely worth your while. Also, look into the El Primero Espada, which is an El Primero, but time only, so it doesn't register as an El Primero, if you know what I mean. All right, we've got Wolfgang in the box from Austria. Alan C. Hi, Tim. Any affordable watches to never sell? Yeah, I think if you have that like rare, like one half a model year, ETA powered Tudor Black Bay Black, hang on to that one. That's a very affordable watch from a very marketable and collectible brand that was built for a very, very short time. So that's one to keep in mind. We've got a question from Chaitanya who's saying, Omega Aquaterra small seconds, buy or sell. Buy if you love, sell if you don't, but you're not gonna make a lot of money on that watch either way. We have a question from Frank V. Thoughts on Omega DeVille, hold or sell? Depends, are we talking about the DeVille Prestige Jump Hour from 1998? Are we talking about the DeVille Coaxial Flight One, overseen by George Daniels in 1999? If either of those, yes, hold. If not, probably not. These are not collectible watches. DeVilles tend not to be keepers in the long term if you're looking to make money. If you're looking to have fun and get good value, then they're great. Okay, jumping back to our regularly scheduled program, Patek Philippe, 2017 to 2018, not two model year, but less than one model year spanning two years. This is the 5961A010, the ebony dial. This thing is the bomb. Can we go full screen, Sean? Less than one year of production, really more like seven, eight months for the black dial model. Even the 2014 to 2018 white dial 5961A in steel is fairly uncommon, but the black one is really something. 40.5 millimeters in stainless steel with a full bracelet. Fit is excellent even for me and my 16 centimeter circumference wrist. A Patek steel sports watch on a bracelet that isn't an Aquanaut or a Nautilus. Think about that. Patek steel production, the years this thing was made, 20% of total production, of which most of that would have been Aquanauts, the Nautilus and the Ladies 24, you can imagine how rare this black dial 5960 was since it was only half of 5961A production. Now, I pitted the RM11 in a comparison won by this Patek, so you can realize just how highly I regard it. Both were flyback chrono annual calendars, but the Patek was easier to rare to wear, more beautiful, scarcer in the big scheme of things, yes, scarcer than the Richard Mille, and just a better watch overall. The 5960 Ebony Dial has it all. Plenty of loom, power reserve indicator, annual calendar with apertures, flyback chronograph, mono counter with both hours and minutes coaxial, an AM PM indicator, and lots of room to appreciate. Current value, prices. These have risen to between 110,000 and 130,000 on average, but that's high, not the limit. Steel 5960s are an opportunity and a hard hold if you already own one. If you're looking to get into collectible Patek Philippe and you've got a budget that supports this, seriously consider it. It's a lot more durable than any precious metal watch, which means it's gonna be more wearable, a collectible you can use, and the scarcity ensures it will always be in demand. Now, 2017, 5522A Calatrava Pilot New York City Edition, 42 millimeters in stainless steel, 600 pieces were made, created for the US market and launched at the New York City Grand Exhibition. This was only sold in the United States through Patek's then 89 retailers with blue dial and New York City 2017 backside silk screened over the sapphire. It's a rare three hand center second, no date Calatrava. Can you think of too many more of those? Uh, and there's even a custom aviator style strap and buckle that's unique to the Calatrava Pilot Series, and yes, it is steel to match the case. It is one of the cleanest and largest Calatrava designs with superb loom and durability in steel. This is a very wearable watch that you can use all the time and enjoy while it gains value. Current value, well first, Consider that six years ago, these retailed for $21,547, and there were concerns at the time that 600 pieces for one national market was too many. They thought at the time that it was too large for a Calatrava. Well, 
They also said Patek had no clientele for a pilot's watch. But now that the value of these has caught up with the importance of a time-only steel Calatrava with center second and a pilot style, this is a bona fide safe haven that allows us to laugh at the one-time doubters. And during uncertain times, this still has room to grow and appreciate. That's right, that's a lot of money gained if you bought these things when they were new back in 2017. And for a time, we had a bunch of them in stock. They were relatively cheap pre-owned. Well, they're not where they're going to end up, but people are beginning to take notice and they love this model. So if you own this model, this is a hard hold. If you're interested in getting in, don't wait too long. 21.5 joining in, we got Soma R. Seiko Spirit Nano Universe. Oh wait, well, maybe we'll do a Seiko and Grand Seiko episode sometime. Curtis Arndt saying that Calatrava Pilot's watch is awesome. And we've got Jim Millet saying 42 millimeter stainless steel Patek, love it apart from the price. I can understand. And then Amit Tim, do you think Longas will be a brand to hold? They're increasing prices a lot. Yes and no, we'll talk about that in a moment. We do have a Longa on the list. Mark S, Tim, JLC Reverso of Rolex or Rolex prints, which do you prefer and why? Well, there's a lot more Reversos out there, so you're gonna find one you really love. Are we talking about some Rolex prints or my old Reverso Platinum Number no. 2 Tourbillon? If that's the case, then my old Reverso. But are we talking about the Broncard Jump Hour prints versus some generic current production Rolex Tribute Small Second? I'm definitely all about the Jump Hour, especially if it's a tiger stripe with two metals co-molded. So that's where I stand on that. It depends on the model and the variant. Okay, we will talk about that, Amit, we will talk about Longa, but first, here's a watch we rarely discuss, the 2006 Patek Gondolo reference 5105P. Now from time to time, Patek does something really cool. They take new old stock movements from around the manufacturer, things from the 30s, 40s, 50s, they finish them to modern standards, case them up, and sell them in limited editions, and that's exactly what happened here. It was created in 2006 in a 100-piece limited series to mark the opening of an upgraded Patek Philippe salon on the Rue de Rome in Geneva. It's a direct tribute to the 1930s vintage reference 492 and you can see the resemblance right there. The 100 pieces were fitted with the new old stock caliber 990 form calibers, that is rectangular, found in storage and upgraded to modern standards of refinement and decoration, but they kept the important things like the train design, the bridge design, and the non-shock protected balance with the swan's neck adjustment. The new gondolo resembles the 492, but packs the punch of a platinum case one diamond between the lugs, a chamfered and contoured crystal, a display case back, and a 35 by 46 millimeter size that wears large and modern. Value today, roughly $70,000, but data points are few, and the watches rarely come up for sale. That's a great sign that it's a watch to hold, as these rarely sell, because people know what they've got, and when they do change hands, they generally change hands between collectors, because the people who own them always know at least one other person ready to take the watch off their hands for market value. Frankly, this is one of the few true classics and always in demand models to emerge from the relatively unappreciated modern gondolo tonneau and rectangular watch collection at Patek. Now here's another one, a very short production run, less than one year. It's the Calatrava 6000G-012. This is based on the 6000 model that came out in 2005, but it came out in 2016. It was discontinued for the larger 6006 in 2017. So these are hard to find, and I think I've only seen one here at Watchbox. The rarest of the reference 6000 Calatravas, and one of the rarest Calatravas of the 21st century. 37 millimeters, white gold, really strong lug profiles, a radial pointer date with off-center seconds. There's nothing not to love here. This blue dial model was less than one year. Micro rotor automatic. This is one of the few Calatravas to use the premium 240 micro rotor rather than some sort of a center rotor automatic or a manual wind. And this caliber 240 has the later upgrades like the Patek Philippe seal, the timing guarantee, and the anti-magnetic silicon hairspray. Despite the 37 millimeter rated size, it is a broad watch that really straddles the wrist. So don't be put off by the size. It wears more like a 39 or even a 40. Current market price is around $32,000, but good luck finding one. There's rarely more than one or two on the market, even on Chrono, even on eBay at any given time. 
All right, what's going on here? Abdul saying this is definitely one of my favorite Calatravas. We have Burning Mr. B saying the 240 is really attractive. And we have a comment from Frank V saying this is one of Archie's watches. Possibly, maybe aspirational. I can't say for sure, but I'm sure he would appreciate it. He's a Patek guy. We have Sean Hansen saying that Gondolo is fire. And then we have Leif Johnson saying Omega Petrograd, buy or sell, buy. Buy and hold. I think someday collectors will discover the museum collection. I don't think that day is just yet, but this is a great time to buy all 10 of the original museum collection watches. Those are awesome, as good as any Vacheron Constantin historique, and in fact, a little bit more faithful to the original than the Vacherons. Definitely the Petrograd buy and hold. An idiosyncratic but lovable Omega Museum Series watch. Geezer, do you think the Patek Weekly Calendar 5212 in steel is a good good long-term play. Yes, people are crazy about those, and I can see Patek giving it a relatively short lifetime to populate the market. Simon C., Linda Verdlin, Octopus Double Date Titanium Yellow, hold or sell. Hold if you love, but I don't think these are going to make you money. I think Linda Verdlin is a great brand run by cool people, making only a few hundred watches a year, and they're very wearable and a lot of fun, but I don't think it's going to make you money. So if you're looking at an investment, no. If you're looking at a solid store of value, it won't lose you money, but it's in a different category than the watches we're discussing today. Okay. Wrist shots. Neil S. enjoys a pina colada in Boca Raton with his Rolex GMT Master BLNR Jubilee. He's got the Batgirl and the drink. Dana A. prepares for serious motoring with his Rolex Sea Dweller 43 and Audi R8 Supercar. Gary S. prepares, well, for a ride in Scottsdale, motoring with his new Hamilton Khaki Officers Field Watch. Philip C. of New Jersey is joined by Lily the Dog. And a birthday gift from Phil to himself, his new lefty GMT, looking good. Tim M., the other Tim M., is at Nintendo World, Universal Studios Osaka, Japan, with appropriate gear. Double wristing, on one wrist, all right. Others, here's some of the fun stuff that's not Patek and Rolex. Omega Speedmaster Caliber 321 Chronograph, a relatively recent arrival on the market. Based on the reference 105003 that astronaut Ed White wore as part of a Gemini mission spacewalk in 1965, this is a re-edition with real soul that stands on its own as a classic in its own right. Finish, durability, refinement, rarity, it has it all. 39.7 millimeters and more wearable than a standard moon watch on a smaller wrist. I like the way it fits. Caliber 321 is a recently reborn classic that has never looked as good as it does in this watch. Made in small volumes, very special. Current value, considering this is a $14,600 new watch, well, it's been on the market for three years. And at 14.6, you gotta consider what they're selling for used. This is one to buy and hold. It will not be around forever. And considering three years in, these things are still selling for over $10,000 above list. It's as strong as any GMT sub or Daytona in that regard. This is one to buy and hold, especially if you can get it at retail. Get on that wait list. If you've got your heart set on this, stay the course. Buy it, own it, love it, and keep it. All right. I would say these are likely never to be worth less than retail and possible to sustain quite a level above retail indefinitely. Now, the Ulysse Norden Freak one, I mean the original Freak, the 42.5 in white or rose gold from 2001, a breakthrough on so many levels. Silicon use for the escapement, one of the first on any watch, the first on any significant watch and in series. Dial side movement trains that allow you to see all the action on the dial side, hugely influential. Virtually the entire movement sits on a carousel that acts as the minute hand. It has a bezel that's used for setting. So you set the time with the bezel and you wind the watch with the case back. A crownless watch and an iconic design in that regard. A double direct impulse escapement with the dual direct on the Freak 1. This preceded all the Carry Voudelainens, the Laurent Ferriers, the FP Journes, and they didn't just do a double direct impulse Breguet inspired natural escapement. They did it in silicon and then they bought their silicon suppliers so they could do it all in house. This is a rare design icon from UN's traditionally chaotic design department. They go in every direction, but everyone knows the freak. It is eternal. You can show a person a freak and he'll know what it is. 
even if he's not a UN guy. The freak is transcendent. And the original was 42.5 millimeters in white or rose gold. It was the smallest freak ever and the most wearable by far. They're currently cheaper than you'd think at forty to forty-five thousand dollars in spite of the rarity. So get one full set. Check to see if it's a freak one or a freak one point five. If you get close enough to the escape wheels, you can tell the difference. A freak one that hasn't had the new wheels swapped in, that has the original dual direct escapement, even though it doesn't run as well, keep it. That's the one to own. All right, Alango Unzona. You asked, now I'm answered. 2018 on, the Alango Unzona Saxonia Thin Copper Blue, this is the 205.086. More desirable and more beautiful than that other blue 39 millimeter chronometer. This is thin as a razor at 6.2 millimeters in white gold with an aventurine glass dial on a sterling silver dial base. This is a rare longa whose dial outshines the movement. The movement is good, it's just that the dial's better. It's underappreciated, stunningly beautiful, and marked for greatness. Now, I think Longa has too many precious metal dress watches that they can't sell, which is why they insist on you buying three or four other watches when you get your Odysseus. This is a watch that frankly deserves to stand alone as an object that you covet. A star of the catalog. The simplest watch they sell, and I believe the cheapest. It's also the best. What can I say? Well, current value and retail. Let's take a look. The retail price is $25,400. Now consider the pre-owned market where this watch is trading all day long below retail price. Now look what you'll pay for that other blue 39 millimeter chronometer. I can tell you which one I'd rather have and which one's more likely to gain in the medium to long term. I'd say the Jorn is just about valued, whereas this is underappreciated. Now, the AP Royal Oak Annual Calendar. Obscure, useful, and very much in sync with the current push for smaller sizes. One of the rarest modern Royal Oak models and certainly one of the rarest complications. Take the 36 millimeter mid-size case from the 14790. Now add a modular pointer date annual calendar. One adjustment per year. Still largely undiscovered and precisely the kind of watch that the watch market wants right now. Blue chip brand, blue chip model line, the Royal Oak, integrated bracelet steel sports watch, a 36 case that wears like a 38, no wait list at the dealers. Current value is 35,000 to 45,000 depending on condition and accessory set. You can actually see there are two different dials, one that has the pointer date inboard of the hours and one that has the pointer date outboard of the hours. I actually prefer the latter, but you have choice, which is a good thing. It's also available in gold. And some of these have doubled in value over the last 10 years, so it's already going places. You can see the two different dial variations. Pick the one you want, buy it, and hold it. A lot of folks don't know this exists, but the market is beginning to recognize because the prices are rising. Buy to keep. Now, probably my favorite watch that we're going to discuss tonight, well, Co-equally with the Longa, it's the Zenith El Primero Retro Timer, a blink and you'll miss it watch from 2010. One of the rarest 2010 model year debuts, Zenith confirmed to me in an email that only about 1,000 pieces were made. I've only seen one example in eight years at Watchbox. It's 42 millimeters steel, a mono pusher flyback chronograph with a quirky always on chronograph. You can reset it, but not stop it. Now. Unique caliber 4055 only used in this model, so total exclusivity of movement with a lovely nickel anthracite coating in the blackened steel version of the watch. Its minute register is marked at eight minutes for mysterious reasons, which may have been one of the designers or executives love for pasta, beans, or rice, depending on what you believe. But it has the high beat heart of the El Primero with the 36,000 vibration per hour beat rate, the automatic winding, and the column wheel action that is as crisp as anything you will find at any price. Water resistant to 100 meters, it's very versatile. It's available in black or steel on a bracelet. And I think the one on the bracelet is the one to get because it's the scarcer of the two. Most of the 1,000 pieces made are the black one on the strap. Current value is between seven and $8,000. So pricing's still very reasonable, but it will never be worth less. And it may someday be worth more. I think it's gonna gain a cult following like the Zenith Mango Dials 
uh, the 90s Rainbow Flyback, and the early series Zenith DeLucas before those. This is going to be in that ilk of Zenith collectible, a real cult piece for the cognoscenti who love the brand. And I think there's price security in the present and real upside for the future, as long as you're not looking to get rich with this watch. I say don't sell because it's so rare, and you may never have another chance to get one if you do sell, especially if it's the bracelet model. That's why I say hold, because sometimes the best reason to hold a watch is that if you regret selling it and you can't get back into it, it's just as bad as if the watch were unapproachably priced. Rarity is what makes this one hard to obtain. And I would also say this, it's a watch for Zenith fans who want a supremely Zenith watch that's rife with typical brand character. Absolute fidelity to the traditions of watchmaking, but a little bit quirky. Watches like this flowered in the brief Zenith Golden Age between Terry Natoff's departure and the homogenized LVMH watch group look that followed Zenith CEO JF Dufour's departure run to Rolex. So this is one to buy for that reason alone. Viewerist shots number four, Jeremy N. of Boulder, Colorado, pairs his green Porsche with JLC Reverso Tribute Small Seconds. And he says the Porsche is green as well. Not necessarily a green car, not a Taycan, but colored green. Ori G shoots for more than three points with his Tudor Black Bay at the New York Knicks basketball game. Taylor R gives us Tudor and trucks, a rarity for us, with his Black Bay chronograph and Ram 1500 pickups. Send me your watches and wheels that include trucks, guys. Chad L goes to work in the court of law with his Rolex Datejust ready for action, strapped for action, you might say. Martin G of Ascot, England, sends us home in a blaze of color with his Rolex Milgauss Z Blue. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Download our Watchbox app so you can start browsing inventory, videos, and headlines immediately. And remember, join me, Tim underscore Masso, on Instagram. Thanks to all of you. Thanks to Sean. Time out, Tim out. And thanks for logging on.